Hosea chapter 14 verses 1 and 2 are our text, is our text this morning. Um, And the message is return to the Lord. I want to start out by asking a question this morning. Do you ever struggle? Do you ever struggle with the difficulties of pursuing Christ-like holiness in your life? Do you ever struggle with the difficulties of pursuing Christ-like holiness to which we are called as Christians in our lives? If you don't struggle with pursuing Christ-like holiness in your life, I would probably think one of two things. I would think either you are not pursuing Christ-like holiness, or you are actually the second person other than Jesus that's ever lived, with the second greatest person other than Jesus who's ever lived. Because if you are pursuing Christ-like holiness in your life this morning, then you know what a battle that can be. You know what a struggle that things can cause in your life to take your eyes off of Christ and pull you away from the things of God, whether it be work problems or family problems or, or ailments or sickness or uh, just there's a number of things that we have to battle every day. The temptation to sin that would get in the way of pursuing Christ-like holiness. I'm simply amazed at how often I struggle with the difficulties of pursuing holiness. I am, however, not as shocked when I fall into sin and backslide against my Lord. It seems as if the examples in the Bible of Christians who fall into sin and backslide against the Lord, far outweigh those who don't. And that can be looked at kind of in both ways. In a way, that's good things. a good thing when you look at individuals like Peter, and, and uh, you look at individuals like Abraham, and you know, all through the Scripture you find individuals who backslid and walked away from the Lord. David, King David, committed adultery, committed murder. You... Uh, find these examples in Scripture and, and we look at that and say, well, I'm glad I'm not the only one who doesn't struggle with my pursuit of Christ-like holiness. Because backsliding is a reality that we have to face on this path of pursuing holiness. And here in our text this morning, we find the reality of backsliding. And yet what we really find, even in the midst of our backsliding, the real theme of our text is the prophet Hosea calling God's backslidden people to return to the Lord. Here in Hosea, the people of Israel had, they had gone away from the Lord. They had turned away from Him. And yet the Lord, ever in His gracious and compassionate way, says, come back to Me and I will heal you. Come back to Me. Return to Me. Now we've already seen this morning that pursuing holiness is often an immense struggle in our Christian lives. And we've already seen how prone we are to wander away from the Lord our God and how easy it is for us to often backslide. But I think something on par with the difficulty of pursuing holiness is the difficulty of actually returning to the Lord when we do backslide. You see... Pursuing holiness can be a struggle. But on par with that struggle is the struggle of returning to the Lord when we do backslide. For whatever reason it is, we find it so hard as humans, even regenerate Christians, to return to the Lord when we backslide. And I think there are several reasons of that. for that. Just three of them that come to the top of my head, pride, shame, and not truly loving the Lord as we should. But are you finding what I'm saying to be true this morning in your own life? You don't have to answer that audibly, but answer it in your heart. It is so often so hard to return to that pursuit of holiness, which is difficult enough as it is, 
But returning to it when we backslide can be such a gutting thing for us. And yet here is the Lord crying out to us, return to me. Take with you words, our text says, and return unto the Lord. Say unto Him, take away all my iniquity and receive me graciously. It doesn't sound nearly as difficult as we make it out to be, does it? But think of it this way, and man, I think I'll hit home with this one. Uh, Young people, there was a day when you didn't have what is known as GPS. So when you went on trips, you actually had to read a road map, or an atlas as they call them. And every one of us in here have, at some time or another, that are old enough to have actually had to read a a, a road map, we've read it wrong at some point or another. (laughs) And we've gotten off track. And we've gotten lost. Okay? And I mean, we're on this road trip and we're really lost. And it's pitch black out now and we're really in trouble. And you know, our wives, ever the blessings, they say, why don't we just go back to that little restaurant we ate at in the middle of nowhere about 30 30 minutes ago and we'll just get some directions and get back on track. And we say, men, return to that restaurant. Are you kidding me? That was 30 minutes ago. We don't have that kind of time to waste by backtracking. So instead, we just keep wasting time and going on in our lost condition. Besides, men, we couldn't really bring ourselves to return to that restaurant and tell them that we are actually lost. We're men. We don't do that. We don't return. And so pride and shame keeps us going in the wrong direction instead of returning. And so I have kind of showed us this morning the hardness of our own hearts. So I want the Gospel of Jesus Christ to soften our hearts and soften that hardness, particularly for those of us who have turned away from the Lord and need to return to Him as our text says. And I want to examine three things this morning. Number one, why we must return to the Lord. Why we must return to the Lord. Number two, how we must return to the Lord. How we must return to the Lord. And then number three, what happens when we return to the Lord. What happens when we return to the Lord. So let's look at the first one. Why we must return to the Lord. And the first answer to that is this. We must return to the Lord because He commands us, commands us to do so. In our text, he says, O Israel, return unto the Lord your God because you have fallen by your iniquity. Now again, since we've been talking about some struggles that we all have in our lives this morning, here's another one. We often don't like to be told what to do, do we? We don't. I mean, let's just be honest with ourselves. Let's just be honest with our hearts this morning. Particularly if we think there's a better way of doing things. We don't like to be told how to do something. But how could we possibly be so daft as to ignore the Lord's commands here? He is the Lord, and we are not. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Could we ever possibly say, well, you know, Lord, I've got a better way than yours. Well, we could say that, but it would be one of the most foolish things we could ever say. Particularly in light of the fact that He is sovereign God. And particularly, would we ever dare say, Lord, I've got a better way than you, when we're the ones who go away from Him in the first place. His solution is really simple. Return to Me. Come back to Me and I will heal you. Well, Lord, I don't know about that. I think I've got a little better way. We're the one that left in the first place. If you ever feel a break in your relationship with the Lord God Almighty, I promise you this, it is never Him who moved. It's always us. And He commands us to come back to Him. Now would you rather, what would you rather have happen than Him to command us to return to Him? It's a really simple command. And it's it's really a gracious command. But would you rather Him just go ahead and rain judgment down on us? as opposed to His gracious and loving command to return to Him. I mean, we just we, we really as Christians, we act as such little children sometimes. 
when our child is walking out in the road and they kind of get out of our sight and, and they're about to head out on a busy street and we say, stop and return to me. That's the most gracious thing that we could possibly say to that child at that moment. So is not the Lord doing what is best in our interest when He says, stop going on that road you're going on and come back to me. And yet in our stubborn pride, we continue to head down the wrong path so often instead of running safely back to our Heavenly Father. We must return to the Lord when we backslide because He commands us to do so. We also must return to the Lord because our gracious Heavenly Father knows what is best for us. Now again, the Lord could just immediately splash us with judgment and punishment when we drift away from Him. But that's not what He does. He is a gracious, heavenly Father. He is a merciful, heavenly Father. He gently beckons us to come back to Him because He's so long-suffering as we find in Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. The Lord passed by before Moses and proclaimed, "The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. What a wonderful promise that we have a merciful, long-suffering, gracious, truthful Father who will receive us back to Himself and He will forgive our iniquity and our transgression and our sin. He's calling us back to Him. He doesn't just automatically pour out punishment upon us. Now don't get me wrong. If you don't return to the Lord, and if you, if you continue to ignore His gracious call, He does have a way of getting our attention. Right? You all are old enough, most of you are old enough to remember those whippings we got when we were young. Our parents had a way of getting us, getting our attention, didn't they? I mean, they were kind at first, gracious at first. They gave us opportunity and they were long-suffering. But when we continue to ignore that, they had a way of getting our attention. And the Lord has the same way of getting our attention as we find from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 through 8. Whoever the Lord loves, He chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom He receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as a son. For what son is He whom the Father chasteneth not? Just asking that very simple question. That little child runs to the road. You tell them to stop and come back. They do it the first time. The second time they try to edge a little closer to the road. Third time they edge just a little more closer. Fourth time they edge just a little more closer and they stop listening to you and they stop heeding your call to come back to you and eventually you have to chasten that child. Are you doing that out of meanness? Are you doing that in the best interest of that child so he or she doesn't run out in the road and get run over? And that's what uh, the Apostle is saying here. Who, what father would not chasten their son? But, and this is a big verse here, if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. What does that mean? Well, a bastard is an illegitimate child. And the Apostle's saying here that if you never feel discipline, if you never taste scourging from the Lord, if you never taste the chastening of the Lord, and you continue on that path of backsliding, the Apostle Paul here in Hebrews 12 says, then are you an illegitimate child and you're not a child at all. It's interesting, isn't it? Why not just say thank you, Heavenly Father, for being so gracious to call me back to you when I go away from you. Why not just make it easy on ourselves? And and why not even when we don't listen, and we know that His chastening that He brings is done in love, why would we despise that? Why not just say thank you? Because I know that chastening is done in my best interest. We must return to the Lord. And here's the application For this first point, let us truly observe God's gracious dealing with us in order that, let us truly observe God's gracious dealing with us in order that 
Number one, we might remember and believe that the Lord has always been gracious to us. So in other words, we need to think on these things that we're talking about this morning and in our own lives, think on those instances that the Lord has been so very gracious to us in His call for us to come back to Him, even in His chastening. Yes, that chastening hurts, but it's, it's necessary for us to come back to Him and we need to remember those times that He's been so gracious to us in order that believing we might fear what we would do if we were to offend such a gracious God. So in other words, we need to have faith and that faith will lead us to fear God Almighty and fear what it means to walk away from Him. And you don't hear that much in pulpits today. What you hear in pulpits today is God is love, and you hear John 3.16, those are all great, and those are all true truths. But we don't hear that we should fear the Lord God Almighty, and fear walking away from Him, and fear offending Him. Now, you remember that when you were a child. You remember those words, you wait till your father gets home from work. You remember those words. Well, How'd that feel? Was there any fear that struck your heart at that moment? Sure there was. And that's how you know we should feel when we offend such a gracious God. We should fear that. And then that fear, that fearing we would take care of our souls to continue to pursue holiness, even though it is a struggle, in order that we don't backslide. Okay? So that is why we must return to the Lord Now, let us look at how we must return to the Lord. How we must return to the Lord. And the first answer is this, with examination of our ways. We must examine our hearts this morning. We must examine our ways this morning. And we must ask this question, do our ways please the Lord? That's the most important question in our lives this morning. Do our ways please the Lord? It's not first and foremost, is my spouse pleased with me? Or are my kids pleased with me? Or is my boss or are my friends pleased with me? No, the first question that should concern us this morning is, is the Lord pleased with my ways this morning? This should be the prayer of our hearts. The psalmist prayed, In Psalm 139, 23, and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. When was the the last time we made this the prayer of our hearts? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Examine me. Try me. Know my thoughts. I want to know if my ways are pleasing To the Lord, it should be the prayer of our heart. This also should be the prayer of our heart from the psalmist in Psalm 19, verses 12 through 14. Who can understand our errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth... In the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. If you just took those two passages that are there in your worksheets this morning and you just prayed those all week long, it'd be amazing, I think, the difference we would see as we examine ourselves and the Lord reveals the sin in our lives to us and we repent of that sin and return to Him. That's first how we must return to the Lord with examination of our ways. Secondly, we must return to the Lord... Ah, that's supposed to be a B there. With humility. With humility, yet with displeasure against ourselves. Now let's flesh that out just a little bit. Because if we examine and consider our ways and find them to be in discord with the ways of the Lord, how can we stand that knowing how good God has been to us? How can we stand displeasing the Lord when we know how good He's been to us? Should not we cry out, Lord, You have been so good to us, and we have been nothing but vile wretches to You? Should that not be what we cry out? I think so. But often, 
what happens is when the Lord afflicts us and chastens us because of our sinful ways and because we're heading down the wrong path, we just get angry at the Lord. We say, why would you do that? Well, it's for our own good. To get us off the wrong path. To get us back on the path of pursuing Christ-like holiness. The psalmist David, he really understood a lot of this, but you can understand that from the life that he lived. David lived a hard life, and though he was a man after God's own heart, there were a lot of things in his life that he just dealt with the rest of his days. I don't think some of those things he ever truly got over, but he understood these things. In Psalm 119, he says, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Nobody in their right mind could say, ah, that affliction was good for me. Right? The world would think you're crazy if you said, well, that chastening was good for me. That affliction was for my own good. But it is to bring us back to the Lord, to get us off the wrong path and get us back on the right path. And what we need to do is we need to come to the Lord with humility, yet displeasure with ourselves. Job understood this as well as we see when you come to the end of the book of Job, and the Lord had been talking to Job for like three or four chapters. Here's how Job answered the Lord. He said, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Job says, you know, I've heard of you my whole life, Lord, but now I've truly seen who you are. And so what does he say? Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. That should be our reaction when we truly get a glimpse of who God is and when we truly get a glimpse of who we are apart from Him. Think about the prodigal son. He was displeased with his ways. And so with humility and displeasure, he returned to his father. He returned to his father. The Gospel says, return to the Lord, for in Him you will find mercy. But it's only until we're truly disgusted with our wicked actions will we find ourselves returning to the Lord. It took the prodigal son being face down in a hogsty before he really came to himself and said, you know what, my servants, the servants in my father's house have it better than I do. He thought he was living it up. He did. He lived it up for the ways of the world. And he found out where the world left him. In a pig pen. And so he returned to his Father. And so should we return to our Heavenly Father this morning and find mercy in Him. How else should we return? We should return with resolution to overcome our sinful ways. You remember in Bunyan's classic, The Pilgrim's Progress, how many trials and afflictions and impediments that the main character, Christian, ran into as he was seeking the Lord. It was trial and affliction and impediment after trial and affliction and impediment. Why is that? Because when Satan sees us getting off the road of sinfulness, he will seek to do whatever he can to keep us from returning to the Lord. That's a principle we all need to understand this morning. We do have an enemy. And he is real. And he will do whatever he can to keep us from returning to to the Lord. We find in Revelation 12 and verse 4, the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. That's the way Satan is. He's just waiting, waiting to pounce, waiting to devour. 1 Peter, we find this... Truth, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion waiting to pounce. That's what a lion does. Walks about. And he's not messing around. He's seeking whom he may devour. We are called to resist him in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. So what is that telling us? That's telling us the only way that we can overcome our adversary, the devil, and overcome the sin in our life is by the grace of our Lord. We find that truth also in James 4, verses 6 through 8. I'll let you read that on your own this afternoon. I want to finish here. The last thing 
we want to look at this. What happens? What happens when we return to the Lord? We have examined how we must return to the Lord. We have examined why we must return to the Lord. But then, very importantly, what happens when we do return to the Lord? Well, the first thing that happens is our thoughts change. Our thoughts change. When we are on that wrong road, and we're on that wrong path, and we're on the backslidden trail, when we return to the Lord, we find our intentions become different. We find when we return to the Lord, our purposes are all of a sudden different. We find when we return to the Lord that the whole bent of our soul is set another way than it was before. It's now set back upon God where it belongs. You see. And this is God's Word that guides all of our thoughts and ways. And this is why I put such a strong emphasis on the preached Word of God. This is why we do the memorization verses each week. This is why we do the catechism questions each week. This is why we do the confessions of sin and all the corporate confessions and the readings of God's Word that we do. And this is why I put such a strong emphasis on the preached Word of God. Because it is only through the Word of God, the written Word of God, that the Holy Spirit can change our thoughts. And that's what happens when we return to Him. Our thoughts change. Our actions change. When we return to the Lord, we no longer want those things that are displeasing to His will. We are repenting. That's what it is. Turning away from those things. How are our actions changing as Christians who return to the Lord this morning? Are they changing at all? Are we really returning to the Lord at all? When we do... When we do, we find our actions to be so much more in tune with the Lord's will. What else happens? Our company changes. Now, this isn't to say that we still don't associate with those in the world, because we do and we have to. But when we return to the Lord, don't we find that we would much rather be with God's people than the wicked? And that doesn't mean everyone you work with or all uh, you know people you associate with and people that you know that are that doesn't mean that they're weak but if they're lost and they're unregenerate there's just something there that's missing there's not that bond there's not that unity that the holy spirit uses to 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 tie our hearts together wouldn't you much rather be in the house of the lord this morning keeping company with god's people That's why I'm always saying, let us come with joyful anticipation, with expectation to the house of the Lord, not with dread. We don't want to wake up on Sunday morning and say, oh, no, it's it's church day, it's the Lord's day. We want to wake up on Sunday morning and say, yes, it's church day. It's the Lord's day. I get to be in the company of God's (coughs) saints. Listen, we're going to spend eternity together. You might as well just start getting used to each other, right? Right? Might as well start liking each other down here, right? And we don't really have that problem in this church, thank the Lord, like a lot of churches do. But do you know some Christians that maybe you're struggling with? Let's get that sorted out. Because those are the people of God that we should want to be with. Our company changes when we return to the Lord. And then finally, our desires change. So, it all comes back to this. Where is your heart at this morning? Where is your heart at this morning? Is Jesus your all in all? Are the things of heaven growing sweeter to you every day? How much emphasis do we put upon the things of God with our desires? Let me ask you this. Are all of our desires dominated by the things of the world? They shouldn't be. Those are temporary pleasures. Not everything in the world is a bad thing, but most things are just temporary pleasures. They're here today and they're gone tomorrow. But the things of God last forever. 
So I hope this morning you've seen through this message that we need the Lord and we need the Gospel of Jesus Christ to return to Him. Let me say this and I'll close and we'll sing our song of response. It is not enough for a sick man to say he will stop doing the things that make him sick if he's already sick. Let me say that again. It is not enough for a sick man to simply say he will stop doing the things that make him sick if he's already sick. What does he need to do? He needs to go to the surgeon. He needs to go to the doctor. He needs to go to the great physician so the great physician can heal him first and foremost. And so if you're here this morning and you know you've gotten off on that back road... You've let, you've let your GPS go, right? You've let the Word go. This is our GPS, Christians. I know that's a terrible cliche, and I hate that I even said it, but there's some truth to it. You've let the Word of God drift away from you. You've let prayer drift. You've let your church attendance drift. You've let all these things drift, and you wonder why you're on that dark road that you were on in those days before you had a GPS. You're lost. Listen, all it takes is going back, returning. It's not as hard as we make it. Just return to the Lord this morning and He will heal your backsliding. It's a promise. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, thank You so much for Your Word, for the promises of Your Word. I pray that this message caused us to think upon what it is to backslide and how we can return to the Lord and continue to pursue that Christ-like holiness. In Jesus' name, amen.